I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Fagu Horowitz, the Marketing and Communications Director for Caring Professionals, Inc. It's good to see you today, Fagi. It's great to be back with PSS and with you, Jeff, and the specific program that you run here for PSS. I've been involved in, I think, all of the programs at PSS and even made a presentation at one of their Bronx locations. So I feel like I'm part of the team. You truly are, yes. I, I have benefited tremendously from PSS. I participated in many Zoom workshops and webinars of Explore Your Future, which is a national group connecting with seniors about how to prepare for after retirement and the next phase of life. If you want a post-retirement career or an, another act, um, I've participated in Life University classes. I've learned about new things. And um, altogether, I'm a very big fan of PSS. So I am thrilled to give back once again and talk to you about unlocking your treasures and passing on your family legacy. There you have an old photo of me and the title here. I called this session Unlocking Treasures because our family stories and our family artifacts are indeed treasures. They are old, they have traveled with our family members, they have stories to tell and stories that our progeny and our next generation will be happy and feel enriched to know. They weren't, they didn't come about through spontaneous com combustion. They have a whole chain of family and travels and geography and culture and religion and all kinds of rich pieces that that can enhance their lives just by knowing about it. So I want to preface my remarks by talking about the fact that these artifacts or these heirlooms, whatever, um, home furnishings, ceremonial objects, art, letters, photos, drawings, clippings that we have in our family collection are indeed treasures and how to have fun with passing them on. So I'm going to preface my remarks with talking about family stories first, then we'll get to the actual physical objects. Now, there was a professor of psychology at Emory University. Um, he's still around. His name is Dr. Marshall Duke. He's a professor of psychology and his wife happens to also have a psychology background. She works with children who have learning disabilities. And a number of years ago in the 90s, um, Mrs. Duke, Sarah Duke, noticed that the children she was dealing with, school-aged children, elementary school-aged children, that knew their family histories seemed to be doing much better socially, in terms of confidence, in terms of handling new challenges. She was very taken by this. So her husband and his assistant, Robin Fivish, who became Dr. Robin Fivish, also a professor of psychology, did some research and set up some research studies to see if indeed what Mrs. Duke's um, hypothesis was true. Would it make a difference to children if they knew the details of their family history and their family narratives? And shortly before 9-11, they drew up for the Family Narratives Lab at Emory a set of 20 questions. You can show that now. You got it. They called it the Do You Know Scale. Um, and these questions to whose answers children may or may not have may determine how resilient, how self-confident, how strong um, these school-age children, 10 to, uh, 10 to 12 years of age, would be. And 
to their surprise, after 9-11 happened, they had the research money to test this hypothesis. And they did find that those that knew the answers to these questions were indeed more self-confident, more socially competent, um, more able to engage with others in a healthy way. They had a high, they had high quality friendships. They had um, less stress and anxiety when faced with challenges and trauma like 9-11. These were New York kids that they studied, even though they were based in, in Atlanta. And so the Do You Know scale became a very popular um, tool for parents and families to, to pass on um, some of their detailed family history. One can do it, one can share this in a series of dinner conversations or, or over family photos or in casual conversations or in formal conversations at holiday parties. But the point is that if kids know the answers to these questions, they, they have a sense that just like their grandparents bounced back or came from nowhere or dealt with poverty and, and, and a fire and moving again and again if the father was in the military or the mother was in the military, they did better. They had a model and they could also feel good about dealing with negative feelings. So if you take a look, I don't know if it's easy or hard to read, but I'll just, I'll just read some of them. Do you know where your parents how your parents met, how each one of your parents grew up, what is the source of your name, why did your parents name you the particular name that they gave you, um, what happened to your mom and dad when they were in school, how did they first meet, where did your grandparents meet, um, what's the national background of your family, were they Scandinavian and when did they come, or did they come more recently in the 70s from South America, did they flee uh, the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, what, do you know the names of the schools your mom went to, and your dad as well, so it's rather detailed, but in subsequent studies, um, Robin Fivish, who really took control of, of the Family Narratives Lab, found that the more detailed and more particular the knowledge, the stronger the child's resilience. Now, let's talk for a brief moment about the best family narratives to tell. Some families, you know, started off with nowhere, classic American story, and then, you know, worked hard, made money and now have a chain of six shoe stores in New Jersey. That's the ascending narrative, the story of coming with nothing or starting with nothing, a little house on the prairie, for example, and then working hard, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and the present situation, which is a positive one. There's also a descending narrative, the one where we had money, let's say the Vanderbilt. So I went to see the Vanderbilt mansion uh, here on Long Island uh, about three weeks ago. And it said in all the placards, you see all these collections. Yes, they made their money. This was the th third generation, but subsequent generations wasted money, did not manage the business and um, did not hold on to the family fortune. So that's the descending narrative. What is best is the oscillating narrative, oscillating up and down, just like an oscillating fan that goes around and around. The family that came, struggled, established itself, lost ground, was confronted by difficulty, but built itself up again, um, even if some members, you know, did not become as successful as others. The up and down narrative, the oscillating narrative is the most helpful to young people uh, because it gives a model of resilience, of overcoming challenge, trauma, difficulties. Very logical, right? So um, I would suggest that those who want to share their family narratives, and there's some things you may not want to share, but 
Having a look at the Do You Know scale from the Family Narratives Lab at Emory is very, very helpful. My grandchildren, for example, know most of it. They don't know all of it. And I think that that's, that's gives me a marker of what to aim for and what objectives and targets to benchmark and meet. Now, um, stories are wonderful. Stories are not printed in books necessarily. Stories are, are handed over even in the 21st century from parent to child, aunts, grandparents, uncles, various family members. So we want to hold on to them and we want to have them forever. So let's switch to, to the third slide where we're going to say what we should have in mind when we plan to preserve our family stories. Why are we doing this? Is it for us? Is it to have a pleasant subject of conversation with our elders? Is it to help our children fill in those projects that they have to do in middle school and high school about their family history? Why do we want to know this? Pride? There are a lot of good reasons. Everybody has their own reason. Now, you may find resistance. One of my grandfathers used to say, we don't have to remember everything, but we're not altering history. And that was passed, passed on to all of us. We don't have to remember all the bad stuff, but we're not deliberately changing the narrative. Maybe there are some small pieces we're going to leave out. You have to remember also that older people may not feel so confident about their memories and they don't want to be put on the spot. So you want, why do you want to know? It doesn't matter. What's such a long time ago? Someone may tell you, even your parents, old neighbor, um, tell them it's important for me to know. I'm interested. I like that era. I had a connection with that person. I I'm fascinated by family history. You have to have some answers because you, you may get some resistance. Now, you also have to think about how you'll preserve the stories. You know, there's 20th century stuff like recording on, you know, it used to be tape recorders. Now we have our phones and nice apps. Um, you can videotape um, using your, your phone or a proper video camera, but that may make the person uncomfortable, self-conscious. Um, what you may want to do is chat a little bit, give the questions at first and make the person feel comfortable and then start recording. You may want to preserve the stories in written form. You're going to make some dates to meet the person and prepare some questions. Remember that there's going to always be follow-up questions. As material comes out, um, you're going to want some more details. Tell me more. Leave it open-ended and simple. And then why questions may not be so easy to answer. Oh, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, that sounds fascinating. I will tell you that a number of years ago, I interviewed my grandmother who must have been in her 80s at the time, early 80s. And I had plenty of time and I told her about it before and I came with my recording device, whatever it was then. And we scheduled the session. She happened to have been in the location where I was that summer. And um, the first time it didn't go so well. She was careful. She was on guard. The second time I included a very loquacious daughter of hers who loves to chat about the good old days and who's very opinionated, still is. Um, that was okay. You saw the you saw the older member of the family kind of preserving the dignity of certain people, and the younger one who was then probably in her fifties, maybe, um, telling it like it is. She was tough. She insisted that whatever, whatever. But then when I scheduled it with a third person, there was a lot of dynamism to to the recollections. Besides three points of view, it went in different directions and they enjoyed it 
a lot more. So what I did then, that was way back, I, I took my audio and I listened to it and I typed it up and I then put it in order because people moved in different directions. And I have probably 30 to 40 pages, which I have since shared. That brings us to the last bulletin, sharing the product. Um, um, so I included that in a family um, chronicle, which I'll tell you about a little later in the program. So deciding how you're going to share it is also something you want to think about before you actually engage. Now, before I go into the tools for preservation of the family stories, I do want to say that these couple of bullets points I derived from um, familyloveletters.com, something I discovered. This was a, this is a program, this came out of her free material, but um, she and her siblings got a letter from their father in his drawer after he died. And they were very taught. This particular daughter, I think her name is Aviva Black on the West Coast. She was very touched. And um, there were there was discussion of values and um, beliefs and some stories. It was a long ethical will type of thing, a directive and a sharing. And she would have wanted her father to tell her more. So she be, got involved in creating these, helping families create what she calls family love letters to the next generation and how to set it up and how to make the person feel comfortable and um, give it thought as well as love and care because there's no point to it if you're hurting people. You want to do it gently, respectfully, and in a comprehensive way, broken into chunks. So the person, nobody feels overwhelmed, nobody feels pumped, and that communication of caring and of love is there. So I found Aviva Black's um, um, familyloveletters.com a nice resource. Of course, she makes you pay for it some of it, you know, a little further down the line, as do some of the other new tools that we have. Um, and that will bring me to the next slide, please. Okay. So we have a lot of tools and technology that can help us today, yet, just like Aviva Black's story and business came out of her personal experience, you have people today that have developed businesses and making tools and helping families research, present, record, and hold on to family heirlooms as well as family stories, both kinds of treasures. So let's look at the first one. Storyworth.com. Storyworth is the story of a middle-aged fellow um, somewhere in middle America. I don't remember where he's from. He was cut off, off from his parents on the West Coast during COVID. And he asked his father a question about his military service. And he asked him to write something and send him an email. He got so much rich material and he started sending his father emails and asking him to tell some of the stories. So he created a business. He comes out of the, the finance world, I think. Um, and he created a product, which I purchased as a gift for a friend of mine. Um, story worth cost you $99 it is a year's worth of prompts. Every week on the same day of the week, the person gets a, about five to 10 prompts and they can choose any one of them and they start typing it up and writing it up. 
um, week after week, it, it stores it. At the end of a year, the individual can edit these stories, add photos, and for the $99, they get a bound book, meaning a, a legacy volume is created through input every week. And my friend did it. She's not very old. She's in her 60s. She did a nice job. Every week she would share it with me since I gifted her with it. I stayed in her home for a weekend. And I thought it would be just up her alley because she is a writer and she comes from a largish family. And um, she always likes to talk about them. So she, here she had the chance to, and she's a published author, a published author, right? She published two books and she writes uh, columns and other things for magazines. So, so it would be easy for her, but she didn't have the pressure of editing. That went, that happened at the end before the year's worth of materials um, um, were collected um, in a certain format and in a bound hardcover book. This is like a micro memoir. I didn't put it down, but a micro memoir is a short memory that is written down, uh, like a page long. You 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 write down a story or a particular holiday event, one isolated incident, and if you if you keep doing that from time to time and stick them in a loose leaf, you will have, after you put it in order, you will have a book of memories to give to, to, to family members, to leave your children or to share with somebody else. Um, so StoryWorth formalizes it, but um, micro memoirs will do the same thing. If you have a, a three ring binder, even if you're not a writer, you can you can collect these and you will enjoy them and so will your family members do so later on. Now, A Life Untold, the second one comes out of Australia and a young couple had a little girl and she was a toddler, I think. And they had the thought that they wanted to tell their stories to their daughter and they began a project of doing so and of course created a business out of it. So that is another option, a life untold, very similar. Familyloveletters.com I, I spoke about. So these are written, Family Love Letters has more of a values and um, ethics, more of a ethical will type of thing, but everybody can customize it and say whatever they want to say. But that's where it, its beginnings were. Now let's look at custom audio books. I haven't used Meet Jane and Saga, but I researched them a while ago. These are depositories, so to speak. Um, people record, and it's smart to tell them to prepare before, and there are prompts, and then it puts it together in an audio book, which you can share with your family. It's a lot easier to record um, an oral history or or narratives told in first person than to type them out or write them out. So that custom audio books by Meet Jane or Saga, you can find them on the internet, are the audio option. Now, there are also devices like apps where you could, history lines and family search. Those allow multiple people to participate at the same time. So you're getting input from your cousin in California and your cousin in Nevada and your, your great aunt who's still alive in Vermont. And um, um, pieces can be inputted, photos can be inputted depending on what it is. And then, it can, then you send out a link. Again, these are apps. You do it when you're standing online at the car wash or whenever it's good. I would suggest thinking through, looking at the items on our third sheet, the why, the how, the scheduling, the time, thinking about it so you come across as someone 
um, who's given this some thought, as well as being able to frame it appropriately. Now, a very easy peasy way, if you wanna go non-tech is use Google to find creative writing prompts for older people um, or even for young people. Where I was born, my early life, my school years, even people in their 30s can do it. Um, but that I don't have to give you a list for or a particular source. You just Google writing, creative writing prompts about family history and things like that. And um, you'll certainly be, um, be enchanted by some of them and want to participate in some of them. Now, let me tell you what I did. Now we'll, we'll do the personal part. Um, my mother died 26 years ago in her early 60s after being sick for a year. And we were heartbroken. And the way I coped, I had a very high profile position and I had a house full of teenagers during that first year. And I found myself up at night you know, with all these, when I finally had a chance to relax in bed, my brain was screening a lot of movies and I was just remembering and remembering and it didn't stop. So what I did was I took a bunch of line pads and put them in my night table drawer and started to write. And once I got it on paper, I was able to relax and go to sleep. I, you know, I got it down it didn't cycle in an endless loop. So I filled 11 pads of paper. After three years, I said to my sister, you know, it's time to recall mom in a positive way and have fun with this. She was quite the character who spoke her mind and um, was very active she was a social worker. She was a leader. She was the oldest of her generation, the first American born great grandchild and grandchild. And um, she was pretty smart. She won a scholarship to University of Chicago, among other scholarships. And um, I said, it's time to recall her from a joyous perspective, her personality, her sense of humor, her pithy lines. So what I did was I prepared an outline with a bunch of prompts. It was about 20 pages long. Um, family myths, are they true? Mom in elementary school, um, big sister Judith, um, quotable quotes. Um, um, this holiday with mom. And I, I sent it to my aunts and uncles, my cousins, my siblings. I got back very, very rich material. I got back material that ranged from a poem um, to shorter pieces like this. I don't know if you can see, to shorter pieces, to longer, you know, pieces two pages long. Um, and it was, it was nice. I tried it year two. And I got much, much less. But every year, um, starting with that first year when I had pages and pages of material that I put in under each category, I printed it out on three punch paper and gave it out in a three ring binder at the commemoration of her one year anniversary of her death. Jews call it a yard site. So I did it year one. I had more for year two. And years three, four, five, I kept adding material. It turned into a chronicle of the family. Those interviews that I conducted that summer with her mother, sister, and cousin, I put that in as well. Every year when we got together, and even when we didn't, I printed these sheets out with fresh material and sent it out. I got the pages from her yearbook. I was in touch with their high school and they were only too happy to help me. I went to a historical society in the city where she grew up and she had family and found I had no idea that one of the uncles had recorded his memoirs and it was in an archival box, an archival paper 
um, as part of the community history. So um, this turn, even though I called it Bobby Unbound, Bobby meaning grandmother in Yiddish, Unbound, it shows her personality, loose, but also it's it, a three ring binder, a living journal of the life of, and I continue to add to it. We found letters in my sister's storage unit. Um, we we asked some people to write. We had quotable quotes. We had a list of the um, of the children who were named after her, and there were many. There were over thirty children named after her um, during the years that I did this. But there came a point. My sister said, "Enough already, Peggy. You know." Stop killing yourself to produce this. It's nice. It's good. We enjoy it. It's beneficial. And my nephews and nieces who didn't really know my mother, I saw it on their night tables year after year. And certainly my father, who had very deep levels of grief the first few years, one year he just said, I'm looking at it. And he went into his room with, with the loose leaf. And came out smiling and laughing. He said, I, I thought I was going to cry, but you you captured her so well. There's so many perspectives here. Her personality came out. So that was my personal project for nine years. And even though my sister told me, you don't have to do this anymore. And I didn't. I still collect it. And anyone tells me a little nugget, I put it, I record it into my phone. And I have enough material. One of these years, I'm going to do a grand finale and a collection of um, things in, that I've heard since then, because they're rich and I have I have nice material. Any articles that have come out in various periodicals about family history, and I've written some of them because I now am a writer based on this experience, um, I put in and it's quite nice. It's quite nice. It's it. If I miss my mother, um, I'll just open it up and read a piece. And we joke around sometimes using her lines, but we all know them, even even my teenage grandchildren, because they're in the book. Um, so so I feel very good about this. It not only jump started my efforts at creative writing, which have turned into a sideline. I am a columnist and I write content for the Caring Professionals Home Care website. And um, I have a draft of a novel I'm going to work on when I retire. My point is that I feel that I captured my mom um, and I have different perspectives and I collected. So the negative part of this is I sort of became the family historian, but and people reach out to me for pictures, for other things. Um, um, and not everybody has the complete set, but I do share it. And if somebody asks for it, and, and it's a very rich, rich source of getting to know someone who who's gone almost 30 years. So that was my creation of particular writing prompts for for my mother. And like I said, it morphed into a family history journal to which we are still adding um, um, some articles from time to time. Let's look at the final piece here. This is very unique. It's, it's a, a program called Twile. T-W-I-L-E, create a family tree with, with a visual timeline. Twile is a website. You have to pay. There are some parts that are free, but it will help you access photos um, 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 and a lot of historical information from other people. And then you can put it together in a visual timeline and you can piece together and have it look nice, even if you don't have everything. You don't have to wait. You just plug in certain pieces. So, so I think it's a big motivator because if you see something, even if it's in progress and not a completed product, it motivates other members of the family to add in. And 
I, I will say something from my personal experience that I think is probably true in other families. There's one driver. There's one driver to whom it matters. I put together a, 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 a slideshow a number of years ago for some people who did something significant for me. And I wanted a, a photo, an old photo of somebody and, and they referred me to this and this one. He's the family historian, he has everything. I mean, he was in his 40s, but he was interested. He collected the pictures. He's an organized guy. And sure enough, he gave me a picture of, of half the crowd when they were like 10, 11, and 12 at, at their su family summer place in Bell Harbor, New York. So what I'm saying is that there's usually one driver. That doesn't mean that that person is the collector. But when it's time to put things together, it is worthwhile to enlist help, it is worthwhile to share what one has, and then you can ask back. Um, and very often people will, because they know you're working on something or you have a mass of material, when they find something, they will send it to you. We lost our uncle um, about a month ago, the week of July 4th. He lived out of state and one of the cousins um, was looking for his bar mitzvah pictures and figured it might be in some periodical, whatever. He did find the clipping, but he found some clippings about my mother um, getting a National Honor Society uh, certificate, you know, when she was in high school and something else. She was awarded a, a different scholarship, a Roosevelt College scholarship. So he sent them to me. If you have the family emails and you have a family list and you send out notices, you know, congratulations to this one and a new baby uh, or this great uncle or second cousin died or whatever. If you're in touch on a regular basis as needs without doing any fancy family newsletters, if they know how to contact you and they know that you have a lot of material, when they find material, they will send it to you. So that's that's the positive. That's the positive. You're doing a lot of the work. Your immediate family members will, will benefit. You can choose to share them. Um, and sharing is always a good idea because when you share, you find out new things and more stuff comes to light. But they some of some of the younger generation has really put in some effort and and knows things that we don't know. Um, I recently asked someone in the family when I wasn't clear about a certain time sequence in the 20s, you know, someone came and then went back and then the child came and then he brought his parents and so on. I was confused about who came when and who moved to the West Bronx and then first from Harlem and so on. So I asked some family members to, pres you know, to get me, a timeline over the summer. Now I've done a lot of talking. Now let's talk about the actual physical projects. How we said that the treasures are the stories and the treasures are the mementos, the artifacts. I call them like museum artifacts. They are objects of value, of sentiment, of history, of craft, of beauty, of art. Now, um, what are you going to do with them? And how are you going to share them? So, and how are you going to create a nifty, pretty, physical projects to preserve those things in a fun way? So, as you may have imagined, the first thing is, I think, to have your photos together. I worked on it years ago. I went, literally went with my scanner on a plane when I was planning a particular trip, but I, I, I gave myself two extra days and I went and scanned photos and, I, and, and letters and I found incredible things. I found incredible things. Um, some were so personal, I didn't even scan them because I don't want that person's progeny to be embarrassed uh, what I found. Um, but scanning the photos is is the first the first resource because visual is always the best. 
if you're if you want to pique people's interest, if you want to have a physical representation of something, you need images. Um, so I would suggest, as I spoke with Jeff earlier before we started the the video, the webinar, there are two resources that are recommended for scanning photos. Anyone can have a scanner. Anybody who's got a printer can scan. You can give them out to Costco. There are people that charge to, to go through your digital photos or digitize your photos. It's over $100 an hour. I suggest, based on New York Times and other recommendations, two, let's switch to um, the, the, fifth, the fifth slide, please. One is called Memories on. Renewed, the first one. Give in your boxes. Um, I was with my friend last week in Chicago. She had a stack of boxes. While I was there, her brother called and said, no, when am I getting the box? When am I getting the photos? And she said, come and get them. Or you have them scanned. She's not ready to do it. It's summertime. She wants to swim. She wants to do outdoor things. It's a winter project for her. You want to have them? Come and give them in. So it, you see the first, she's got the photos. Her mother has the albums, but they need, they need organization. So Memories Renewed is a place in Minneapolis that returns them in perfect condition. They will fix your photos. They will restore them. They will brighten them, et cetera. Dig My Pics is a much more low budget one. It allows you to delete. Now, I will say this. My little um, nifty gadget that I've been using since this spring is this item. It's the size of a tape recorder. It's a Canon selfie wireless printer. It basically works like an old Polaroid camera, except it's wireless. I have photos in my computer and of course preserved on Google Photos, whatever. I send them from my computer to my phone and then I send them wirelessly to that printer and out comes a photo. So when we're taking a family picture and the kids are visiting with the grandkids, I snap a photo and I can print it out and give it to them in their hands. But I find it a lot of fun um, if I make a party and say, everybody has to bring me two pictures. I've done this with my cousins two years ago to commemorate my mother's um, life on Mother's Day, we did it. Um, and I only had certain cousins there, like the, the blood relatives, not the ones who married in. If you had a spouse, fine and good. But the point was people who knew her and we had a whole program, but they brought photos. They brought old photos and I wasn't going to stand and scan. So they had to leave them with me today. I would, I would either take a picture. It would go much faster or I could scan it. I'm finding this printer a lot of fun to use. I will tell you, and this is a little bit of a sidebar, that um, I wrote an article in one of my columns called, Don't Show This to My Grandchildren. When I learned about this nifty Canon selfie, S-E-L-P-H-Y, wireless printer for 150 bucks, I had this brainstorm for what I was gonna do this summer. I usually have some grandchildren who go to summer camp and I write them cards, you know, roses are red, violets are blue. You know, I'm here in this city and I miss you or, you know, chit chat. Nothing really substantive or memorable, but they feel good because they get a pretty card. But this year I decided I'm going to print out some photos from my, from my collection. Photos of my mother, photos of my mother and her siblings, people that they don't really know very well. They didn't know my mother at all. It's 26 years. But um, um, I'm having fun with that. In the first envelope, I printed the article, don't show this to my grandchildren. I had hinted since that was published in like May that something I published something about my grandchildren and they say, let's see, let's see. And I'm like, no, 
bide your time. And I, I printed that out, added a few pictures and wrote who it was and stuck them in an envelope with a stamp and sent them off. And that's what I've been doing once a week um, during these summer weeks when they are at summer camps. So yes, they're getting individual photos, but at our next family gathering, which is going to be a bat mitzvah in about two weeks, the the family bat mitzvah, my granddaughter's going to have a party with her friends where she lives, but this is for the family members, the immediate family members. Um, every the 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 party favor is going to be, I have them already, a, a, a photo album, and I'm going to give them more pictures to put in. This way, I'm trying to connect them um, with my family legacy and encourage them to have a sense of who these people are. Um, and I'll tell you what I did at the last family event that we had. I, I had my selfie printer ready. It wasn't working perfectly, so I got another one for free because it was under warranty. I printed out some photos, some of these old photos from the 1920s and 30s, interspersed with a later one. This one's from the 1960s. It's my brothers who are twins in their high chairs with their aunt. Um, and I stuck one in each roll. Everybody had a dinner roll. And we had a meal and then the program began and it kind of provoked conversation. Who is this? When was this? Et cetera. And I wanted to show it to you. I forgot to bring it here in this room, but I put on an easel, a short family tree that one of us had made for about three, four years ago for a family party. So they were able, their, their interest was peaked. Um, um, they they could figure out or they could ask which generation this was. This was really before, so they could see it's not on this family tree that's three or four generations. It's a generation before. So um, I I have I'm having a lot of fun with this selfie photo printer. Um, next holidays, see. Um, and I will rem remind those viewers who will be viewing this in the future that in the fall, I'm going to be doing another Zoom webinar on holiday crafts for families, but that create a sense of family connection. So I'll give you a little tease here. You can take these sepia-toned uh enhanced photos and you can create a wreath. If you get um, scrapbook papers, very helpful, you know, also in the browns um, and you mount these, you trim them, you, you crop them, you mount them and then make it a circle and you have a beautiful holiday wreath. You can create a banner, each one on a triangle um, and hang it across your fireplace like people do for Christmas. You can make a matching game. There are loads of free programs on Google, you can find on Google, um, match a memory game or match the name and who it is. You can play at a holiday party. I've done placemats. Um, let's say a family of five, three children and parents across the middle. Too many is not gonna be good, um, but that's the placemat and then you have a clear plastic plate for the food. Um, you can mount collages, you can do a photo display. Those are more work. I like to do something that's easy, that is disposable. I prefer that they remember and hold on to it, but I have the, the template. I have the original stored in my computer. So um, if they put together a scrapbook or something, they can always ask me for it and I'll email it. Um, you can also take out religious items, cultural items, artifacts at a holiday party. And we can create our own traditions. Um, my friend told me about a particular pop-up book that I take out every Hanukkah. I don't want it lying around because it's an expensive book because um, it has intricate pop-ups, but it's a great um, source of discussion because it's about 
families travels um we're blocked a little bit jeff but it's okay i can read it um if someone walks into a holiday party and they see six posters of halloweens of the 60s halloween photos or graduation photos it creates a sense of historical context who could that be and you can create a game with it um so holidays everyone's coming together um and you want to control this is what i learned have a time for eating and socializing and chatting but you want to have a program um, you want to have a program that's age appropriate for the different age groups and so on. So um, I try to do something that's that th that has time and, you know, for the kids. And then we adults sometimes play a headbands game. You have to guess who it is, who in the family, leave clues. It's a lot of fun. So let's go to the next bullet. Collections, crafts. If someone's got recipes. If your family traveled at, uh, from a far place and 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 made several stops in this country or on this continent, it's fun to follow that and to have a visual reminder. You can blow up. You can put a map on the wall and and um, put up flags or create a game for for putting those flags. Who traveled from? San Antonio to San Francisco in the 1960s. This is good for the adults, but you could do a different, a simplified version with kids um, and more recent things. So that would be, now I wanna say a word about digital photography. There are many, many sites I am shocked to find that give you historic photos from different cities. I looked this up, a a few years ago, and I knew that 1940s, New York City sent photographers out and they have pictures of every building in the 1940s. So I found my grandparents' house 10 years before they, they moved in there. Um, but I found a collection in Chicago that had um, a picture of, of the house where my family lived, and we have no picture of the outside. Um, so that was, that was a real find. And the architectural groups, um, have data collections that are merged. So all you have to do is Google, God bless Go Dr. Google, because you can find things in other cities eat and, and there's an aggregate site from some of the architectural groups. And then there are architectural and historical groups from each individual city. So you can find you can find those. I took my grandmother in her early 90s on a digital tour to where she grew up in Hungary, which she left when she was 12 years old. And then she subsequently visited when she was in her 60s. But I was able to find some pictures and she was speechless. She was speechless. It looks the same. This is how it looks. There was this there. There was this there. This was missing when I when I went back in 1985. It was fascinating. And I did the same with some of the old neighborhoods she lived in here in the United States. So you have to prepare for this. You have to prepare this. You can't expect an older person or a younger person to have patience. You've got to do the work. But if you want to gift your family and create these projects, there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done. It's not just going to the store and buying things. One, now let's go to gifts. I would, to create a sense of the treasure that is your heritage, to frame it with respect and value, give gifts that are connected to your heritage. Whether it's a mug with a picture of your great grandparents, their wedding photo, or or a themed photo book, or um, uh, one, one set of grandchildren went on a trip with us once here on Long Island, to a botanic garden, my daughter made it, submitted the pictures and they made a little tope for me that says, grandma, carry us with you. They lived far away then. Um, and there are pictures from that event. I don't have it here. I don't know where it is, probably in my car. Um, but if you give gifts related to memories and, and old me 
family history, it is of tremendous value. It shows respect and it provokes interest. One of the, the final thing in that bullet, family tree wall decals. That's what I'm going to give uh, probably for Hanukkah. I'm not going to give it soon because I'm bombarding them with photos. But you can get for $25 on Amazon and various sites, Google it, a wall decal that's removable that looks like a tree. And then you put pictures on what you have or documents up and you can take it down. You put it up for three months or you give it to your kids for a holiday. They'll, they'll have fun putting it, putting photos and, and documents up and then they'll take it down. They don't have to be married to it. Okay. With one minute well, I left, I just want to say one. one, go ahead. Yeah, I know. I have one last piece and that is, a maker space. A maker space is, is the common term for materials for collages. If if you want to do an event, create a historic frame for an artifact, or or create um, uh, using a a a plastic charger from Dollar Tree, some nice, put a picture in it and match some some uh, ribbon and some embellishments from scrapbooking. You have to gather the stuff. You have to buy some stuff and gather the ribbons and the glue and the scissors and lay it out and have it planned. I've done this. It works, but it needs a lot of planning, you know, and, and you need to work with, with someone in your family to manage the numbers, to pair up the, the, the people who work on it, to, to ask them if you, if they think people will be interested in it. Can you get stencils? Can you get fancy markers, gold, puffy paint, whatever it is? So what I'm saying is spend the time, spend a little money, connect and communicate and share your family legacy with planning, with, with stories and with materials and photos. Thank you. Thanks so much, Feige. Uh, wow, this was like so much information. Who knew that there were all these resources out there that you could actually do a serious family history 